welcome to my channel welcome to john's model making today i've received issue 75 to 78 of hashit's build spitfire mark 1a now the thing is with today's delivery is it's all about the base so we've got four issues and basically we're just making up a base yeah a couple of pieces like that some side panels a couple of brackets and that is that so what i will do with these issues i will speed build them and then we'll concentrate more on the magazines and the ice cubes that are with them which there's always something fascinating in the magazines quite a few pages so yep we got the burma campaign oh, there we go starting work on the display stand um that is for the next four issues and it's still not complete after these four issues um i think three quarters of the base and the sides are on but there's no top and obviously the other 25 percent of the base is to be added so i think we're looking at another at least another four issues before this this uh display base is uh, completed but never mind we still got the magazines to have a look at excellent stuff anyway let's get on with the build okay so issue 75 so a look at the parts get them out of the box Got a box like this there's two panels in this one and two side panels obviously we don't need the box a couple of brackets there we go both these bottom display panels have got numbers number one number two and these two side panels are slightly different they basically it slides together like that they both have a number one there and a number one there so you just make sure you get it correctly positioned like so oh. so we have side part dis side part for display stand two base panel for display stand one base panel for display stand two support bracket connecting bracket five 4.85 mil pm screws five four m4 washers five hexagonal nuts and five 2.5 times six mil pwb screws there we go so basically That's all said. That is all we have to do with that issue. Excellent stuff. So you can see these next four, or the next three, how big this is going to be as well. I think the next one we'll do another one here. Excellent stuff. Right. 
There we go, that didn't take long. The next one's certainly not going to take as long. Let's have a look at the magazines. So, first page Last Raids. The final clashes between Japanese aircraft and Spitfires defending Northern Australia took place between July and November 1943. In the picture is a Spitfire VT of number one fighter wing. Scrambles from Bush Air Strip near Darwin in July 1943. The frequency of Japanese bombing raids on Darwin tailed off following the large scale attacks in June and July 1943. Units made good their recent losses and the Allies exerted growing pressure on the enemy elsewhere in the southwest Pacific. However, the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force and Imperial Japanese Naval Air Force continued to mount regular reconnaissance flights with their KI 46 diners and, and Spitfires shot down a number of them. The enemy conducted two small night raids in early August. Then on the 17th, three KI 46s fell to the Spitfires in number 452 457 squadrons. The last of these aircraft was claimed by Wing Commander Clive Caldwell. Clive Caldwell, sorry, who climbed to 32,000 feet and eventually spotted the enemy aircraft at about 26,000 feet. Opening fire from 200 yards, he closed in to 50 yards and saw strikes on the KI 46s fuselage, tail, and starboard engine, which immediately caught fire. Caldwell then set the port engine ablaze and the aircraft fell away and crashed into the sea. This was the last claim for the leading Australian ace of World War II and it also made him the most successful Spitfire pilot against the Japanese. And on the next page we've got the number 457 squadron operational with RAF fighter command for just a year number 457 squadron was sent to Australia in 1942 to defend the country from attack by the Japanese. In the final months of the war, number 457 squadron flew Spitfire 8 from in the Borneo campaign. This Spitfire 8 MV136 flown by Flight Lieutenant G. Campbell shared in the destruction of a KI-46 on 20th of June 1945. This proved to be the unit's final aerial success. One of the 650 series squadrons formed in the first six months of 1941. Number 457 squadron was established at Baggington in Warwickshire on 16th of June 1941 under Article 15. The latter saw Australian, Canadian, New Zealand pilots taught to fly by the Empire Air Training Scheme before joining squadrons overseas. At the time of number 457 squadron's formation, its CO, flight commanders, and ground crew were British but the majority of the pilots were Australian. Oh, the jubbler. And then on the last page we got the Burma campaign 1942 to 1945. Burma was one of the most hard fought campaigns of World War II. In early 1942 Japanese forces advanced rapidly in the first phase of the Pacific War. Rangoon fell in March and ooh, Mayakina in early May as the British Army retreated, retreated to India. In the picture a P-47 Thunderbolt fighters on at an RAF base in Burma in 1945 take off on a sortie to attack the retreating Japanese towards the end of the Burma campaign. The Burma road joining the railway from Rangoon at Lashio and leading northeast to Kunming in China was vital for the supply of Chinese forces. Japanese control of much of the road meant that the only supply route was by air uh, over the Himalayan plateau nicknamed the Hump. The American volunteer group, better known as Flying Tigers, which provided the main US air power at the time, was absorbed into the 23rd fighter group with most of its pilots choosing the option to return to civilian life or the Navy or to become transport aircraft pilots. AVG Commander Colonel Claire Lee Channel was promoted to Brigadier general and put in charge of air units in China, later taking command of the 14th Air Force. That goes on for four pages, it talks about the Japanese fighters, the Chindits, um, the picture of a Nakajima Ki-43 Oscar Japanese aeroplane, there's rescue missions as the Japanese continue to fight fiercely in Southeast Asia, the first rescue operation flown by helicopters into Bur Burma took place in April 1944 and on the last page it shows the Myanmar Thailand Japanese death railway line starts here 1942 to 1943 a memorial plaque marks the starting point of the Japanese Burma Siam railway line 
And in the next issue, we have two side sections and a base panel, plus metal brackets and screw fixings. Okay, so issue 76. Okay, so we've got issue 76. We've got the first corner of the display stand to fit in this one. I've already taken the parts out of so the box. We've got the base panel here. We've got the side part for display which is the short one and we have a long one that's 7601 and 7602 7603 is the base panel 3 then we got support bracket connecting bracket and a corner fixing bracket for this and we have the usual screws 6 4 times 8.5 mil pm screws 6 and 4 washers 6 hexagonal knots and 9 2.5 times 6 mil pwb screws which are the black ones excellent so what i'll do i'll speed this up uh so as you don't get bored out of your heads see how big that is there we go better on this camera see this side is still loose obviously needs fixing up but that is gonna be massive okie dokie that's issue 76 complete anyway you can see how big this is there we go part to fit here but there we go on to the next issue I don't know they just fix it together and just show you what it's like when it's finished to be honest it's not a great lot of interest in putting a display stand like this together but anyway issue 76 in the magazine we've got the fledgling TAF as part of the Allied planning for D-Day Area Fatacon reorganised along more tactical lines during the course of 1943 so that its Spitfire squadrons could better support the invasion. In the main picture we've got Spitfire VBs and number 421 squadron taking part in exercise Spartan in March 1943 during the preparations for the invasion of Northern Europe. By the spring of 1943, planning was in hand for the support of the Allied armies in France after the proposed D-Day landings. Tactical air forces were to be formed for this task with the RAF supporting the Anglo-Canadian 21st Army Group. Many of the existing Spitfire squadrons would be transferred to the fighter bomber role, but to avoid disrupting continuing offensive operations, units marked for the TAF remained with fighter command for the time being. The changes would be were to begin in the summer when Army Cooperation Command was absorbed while Fighter Command would remain until the HQ of the Allied Expeditionary Air Forces was formed. There's a couple of pages there and a few more pictures. And then on the next page we've got Schwein Hegland, the highest scoring Norwegian ace of World War II, claimed the majority of his 15 victories flying Spitfires in 1942 and 43. And in the picture we've got Captain Schwein Hegland of number 33. 
one squadron in front of his damaged Spitfire 1XM A568. His spinner was hit by port by part of an FW190 that he had attacked on 16th of August 1943. You can see it on the nose cone. Schwein Hegland was born in Christiana, now Oslo, on 10th of December 1918. In the autumn of 1939, he tried unsuccessfully to enlist in the Norwegian Army Flight School and subsequently travelled to Zurich to study engineering. He was in Switzerland when Norway was invaded by Germany in April 1940. Fleeing to the United States via Bordeaux and Portsmouth, Hegland then headed north to Toronto, Canada upon hearing of the establishment of a Royal Norwegian Air Force training camp, which soon became known as Little Norway in southern Ontario. Excellent stuff. That goes on for a couple of pages. There we had a lucky escape. With a picture of him with his uh, comrades. And then on the last article we got the V1 flying bomb. The first flying bomb was used against British and Belgian cities in a costly German campaign that created terror among the civilian populations. In the 1930s emerging rocket and jet propulsion technology offered new possibilities for unmanned long range weapons. The German army was developing the Air 4 rocket under Dr. Werner von Braun but the Luftwaffe also wanted a part in this means of waging war. The, the solution came with a pulse jet motor developed by the Argus Engine Company with an eye to using it for a target drone called the ooh, let's, what's this? Flaxil Garat 43, the FCG 43. The pulse jet is similar to a turbojet. Fuel and air are mixed in a combustion chamber and ignited the explosion forcing gas down a tube for propulsion. Secondary shot waves return to the chamber and ignite subsequent pulses. To stop gas leaving via the intake, Argus added a system of shutters which opened and closed several times a second as a fuel air mix detonated. This gave the pulse jet its distinctive but put sound, but caused vibrations that could damage the airframe. And that goes on for quite a few pages. The Republic Ford JB2 Thunderbug. On the last page, the V1 was of such interest to the Americans that as soon as enough significant parts were collected, they, shipped, they were shipped to the Army Test Base at Wright Patterson Field in Ohio. There, the staff were ordered to build 13 working copies. The reverse engineering of the 772 pound thrust Argus ASO 14 motor was achieved in just three weeks, and the first test flight took place on 8th of September 1944 under the designation JB2, Jet Bomb 2. The US missile differed in the shape of the forward engine supporting pylon, pylon and in having radio command guidance. A production order for 1,000 airframes was made to Republic Aviation, who subcontracted it to Jeep maker Willys, with Ford building the mortars. Plans used against Germany and then Japan were cancelled as European and Pacific wars came to a close, and only 1,392 examples were ever built. Excellent. And the next section we've got more panelling for the display base. Two side sections, a base panel and brackets for fixing the parts together. Right, well, I hope you did enjoy that. That's issue 75 and 76 completed. Um, looking at the instructions for 77 and 78, it's not much different. But I think, as uh, I said earlier, um, I think that is the complete um, half, first half of the base. We have a side panel to put on, um, and I think I'm going to be able to manage to get it on my shelf in here. I've just got to do a little readjusting in here to get it in. It is a lot bigger than I expected it to be. Um, and I have got another plane um, which is going to have a similar base to this to actually get in here as well and I think I can just about get that in as well I mean we have got too many bills but so anyway if you did enjoy that give us a big thumbs up um, hit that notification bell and subscribe please um, stay safe and I'll see you soon for issues 77 and 78 thanks for watching bye